Good evening. Welcome to Progressive Soup. My name is David Stevenson. I'll be the host today. With me, we have a young man who is a candidate for Bethel's second state rep, state uh, representative seat, the second district in Bethel's state house. Um, Reheb Ali Brennan, and uh, he's going to tell the audience, he's going to tell you a little bit about who he is and what his platform is, what he believes in, what his core values are. First of all, Reheb, thank you for joining me. Thank you for having me. Who are you? Tell us about your family. My family, yeah. Well, I mean, it comes with the name, and you know, yeah. everyone always asks me, what are you? Um, so, but my father, he's from Guyana, the top of South America, yep. and he immigrated uh, to Queens, New York, when he was very small, and there he met my mother. She is a blonde-haired, blue-eyed, Irish Catholic girl from mm-hmm. Queens, and they had me and my two sisters. Um, when I was in the second grade, they decided to move to Connecticut for, oh. you know, better schools um, and a better life for us. Uh, so they moved here, and I've been living here ever since. Uh, went to school, uh, Bethel High School, graduated in 09, and was involved in St. Mary's Church. Went on a bunch of mission trips, and, you know, I'm still an active member of the church. And then I went to college at Marymount Manhattan College. Excellent. Yeah. That's the gist. The That's gist. the gist. <laughs> Okay. And then the name, the name, my father, uh, yeah. he named me after the American football player from the 90s, Rahab the Rocket Ishmael. So it has nothing to do with Ishmael. our background. Yeah, yeah. okay, yeah. So it has yeah. nothing to do with, our, uh, with my background. The Rocket, I remember that. I remember him. So that's yeah. why I tell people, I'm like, I'm just your average Guyanese, Irish, Catholic, American with a Middle Eastern first name. <laughs> so <laughs> I am the boiling pot. <laughs> this, this is America at its best. Yes. Absolutely. <laughs> to have, to have all, all these things together. And one my, uh, my, my dad's parents came here from Ireland uh, about the turn of the last century, about the early 1900s. And, well, things were very different back then as far as immigration goes. They got off the boat. There was somebody waiting to meet them, wave a wave. They were off the boat, and they were in Greenwich caretakers on a large property in, in, uh, in Greenwich, Connecticut. Mm-hmm. So it was a little easier back then, yeah. to say the least, to become an American citizen, and um, I'm, I've always hoped that it would become that easy again, because America, as you note, is a melting pot and benefits greatly from having folks from all different backgrounds mm-hmm. come here with, a, with the expectation of working very hard and having an opportunity to advance themselves. I, said, I mean, today my father, he's a Connecticut small business owner in Stanford. He, you know, employs many people from Connecticut, and um, he's in the IT sector. So, you know, he didn't really have the education, but he kind of read his way through and kind of, I guess, missed that yeah. little loophole in the 90s where you could kind of, you know, you didn't have to go to school to become oh, successful. Yeah. You don't have these, you know, prerequisites. Yeah. So, um, yeah, today he's a s- successful businessman, and you know, his drive, I think that's very much in me. Um, so I'm thankful that he came here. <laughs> Absolutely. As, as I'm, I'm thankful that my, that my uh, dad's parents came here. My mom's parents came over, I think, on the second Mayflower. So they were here a little earlier. <laughs> but um, but it's, um, it's, it's great to be here in this country and the opportunity it affords us. Now, mm-hmm. the issues, the hard part, the issues. You're running for the second state assembly district in Connecticut. Mm-hmm. You have a candidate who's retiring, Dan Carter, yes. who's been there for, I think, either two or three terms. And you have an opponent, Will Duff. Now, would you mind starting with talking about Connecticut's gun legislation that was enacted? And what you think about that? Because we know that Dan Carter voted against that. He's been on my show. I gave him the opportunity to explain the rationale behind his vote. Didn't didn't agree with him, but I you know he had the opportunity, and that's always a good thing. I like having people on that I don't necessarily agree with, but are, are thinking people. Where, what's your relation to that that important gun legislation? Well, I think to start, I mean, obviously, um, you know, I will defend um, the existing guns we have, uh, the laws that we were passed in 2013. Yep. Um, you know. When I go to the state house, I will defend what we have on the books and make sure that we are, you know, f- you know, filling the rest of the loopholes that are there. I think Connecticut's done a great job um, so far, and for Dan Carter to vote against all, you know, 
and not even to offer what's your solution. You know, if if this if you don't agree with this, where can we compromise here? Where can we fit something in? It's easy just to say no, no, no. And why is that? Because you're toting the party line. Yeah. Like uh, I just don't understand how you can. You know, you're representing part of Newtown. You know, it's not Sandy Hook, but it is still that community, yeah. and those people still care very much, as well as Redding, um, about you know having you know gun safety. And for him to vote against that is just out of my mind. And that's kind of the reason I decided to run was to be against Dan Carter to challenge him, but he's running now against uh, the U.S. Senator. Yeah. Um, and that was kind of like why I wanted to get involved, because I know the people here in the district aren't having their voices heard, and they're not being well represented in Hartford. And I think William Duff mm-hmm. will just be another placeholder like Dan Carter. He'll be the same voice, just complaining, um, no real solutions, no alternative uh, you know, fixes to anything. Um, so that's why I wanted to come here, and when I knock on doors, that's what people say. They don't think they've been well represented, and they're, they want a fresh voice and a new, a new face. It's probably important to note that, um, that that gun legislation that was voted in in 2013, that um, after it was voted in, gun homicides in Connecticut from 2012 to 2014, from one year, skipping 2013 when the bill was enacted, Gun homicides in Connecticut were essentially cut in half, actually a little bit less than 50% of what there had been in 2012. So anybody that believes that the gun legislation did not have a positive effect, well, there's your your evidence that it did. There's literally over 100 lives, people walking around that that probably wouldn't be alive and walking around without that gun legislation. And then... I think recently, too, just uh, this past uh, session, uh, Dan Carter voted against the, uh, there was a domestic bill um, for abuse. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, if the partner, if someone files for, you know, a restraining order or that, you know, they're being abused, um, you know, if they're a gun owner, they, the state will come in and say, you know, we're keeping your gun away from you for, uh, the, you know, the period of time before the case is settled, you know, to save lives. I mean, you, I know it's assuming, but, you know, these things are here because we need to make sure that, you know, people aren't losing their lives. And um, in domestic abuse, it's important that, you know, we stand by these people who have been victims and we know, you know, the tragedies that happen. We know that a lot of gun homicides are, are, are within families and in a, lot, in a lot of cases they're husbands killing wives or wives killing husbands mm-hmm. in domestic disputes. Yeah. Because what, what better thing to have in your hand when you're really angry at somebody and are thinking, I'd like to kill that person, what better thing to have in their hand than a gun yeah. to accomplish that goal? Mm-hmm. But... Um, so other issues. What other issues pique your curiosity? And what other issues have you been thinking about as being important points in what you would do going forward as our state representative? Yeah, well, I mean, I think obviously uh, economic development is on everyone's mind. Uh, the state kind of isn't, in, isn't going in a very good direction right now, and um, we need to make sure we have new voices and fresh faces to kind of switch things up. And, you know, as the son of a Connecticut small business owner, I hear how hard it is to grow a business in Connecticut. And First-hand experience, yeah. certainly, yeah. And it's not just personal. I mean, for a 25-year-old my age, you know, I want to make sure that I'm there to vote first, you know, legislation to keep the state, you know, prime for people my age. Like, if I want to stay here, if my friends want to stay here, you know, right now it's very hard. Whether you're buying or you're selling a house, it's, um, or you're renting, it's this, the prices are through the roof. So to make sure that we're... You know, kids my age or future generations want to stay in Connecticut and stay home. Um, if they're able to do that, fine. But I think it's kind of why wouldn't you rather, you know, pay high rent in New York City where you have more opportunity, and then you know, and rather than stay home and you know go through the same thing with less opportunity. So I want to make sure it's you know. What type of small businesses are are prime for the improvement? Well, I think it's more. You know, investing more in green green jobs, mm-hmm. that's something that I, you know, I, when I worked in Congress, I worked on um, a lot of energy and environmental issues and, you know, realizing that there is a big capacity for, you know, economic growth with green jobs um, to make sure that we're incentivizing, uh, you know, solar with houses and, you know, upgrading our hydro grid. So there's a lot of things, there's a lot of room. I think it's just having the conversations. I mean, maybe not everything is the right answer, but as long as you're offering solutions that we can talk about, um, I think that's where we start and we see, you know, with transportation, making sure that, you know, we have walkable communities and that, you know, transit-oriented growth so people can get from where they need to be. And, you know, the Metro North is the second 
biggest um, you know, used rail in the country, and we need to make sure that we're updating it and we're double tracking in Danbury. And I just think it's having these conversations of what we can do instead of just complaining that nothing's working. Has there been any talk about um, upgrading our, our rails from here to Norwalk mm -hmm. to electric? Because I remember Jason Bartlett, who held your position mm -hmm. um, for two terms, um, that was one of the things that he talked about a lot was upgrading. Mm -hmm. It's expensive. Yeah. Anything like that is expensive. But the benefit of that, of course, would be that you could take a train without that D, uh, getting off the train and getting on another train in Norwalk yeah. to finish your, your travel to New York City would save a lot of commuting time. Have you heard anything about that possibly I mean, I haven't heard anything, up but again? I think that's definitely a conversation I would like to have, and I think, you know, as well as double-tracking the Danbury line, making sure that, you know, we're not just running one train, that, you know, you know, we can move people faster to the city, and it's not, like, a long process of trying to get to work, and then you're all dri everyone's driving and congesting the highway, so... It's true. They've got the right-of-way in place, and they could, they could do a, a second line, a yeah. second rail. So that's... Um, conversation to be had, yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> what other issues are you interested in? Um, well, I think also uh, some, a big issue for a lot of people is the opiate epidemic. Um, that's something that has been terrible, and, you know, it's affected every community, I think, across the state. Um, you know, I have friends from high school that passed away, and it's just something that we need to make sure that we're educating the youth on. Um, like I've said before, I remember D.A.R.E., I think the D.A.R.E. program, we need to make sure that, you know, young kids know not to touch mommy's pills or, you know, not, it's not just the drugs that, you know, we're used to hearing about marijuana and cocaine and all those, yeah. those bigger drugs. It is like, you know, just, you know, pain medicine and um, we need to make sure that we're doing more. And I know, you know, we recently passed uh, good laws to make sure that people aren't doctor shopping, um, but to make sure that we really are educating the yeah. youth and starting before it's too late. Yeah, I know op opioids and, and I guess a lot of, a lot of folks when their prescriptions aren't fillable again, or if the prescriptions are run out, they'll find someone that's dealing in heroin yeah. and using heroin as, a, as an alternative. And that, that is causing a, a, lot of, a lot of death and a lot of, um, a lot of very horrible situations. And I've heard about this all over, all over the country, that it, this is happening. Yep. Education. Mm -hmm. Where would you like to take us in education? Well, I think... Um Focusing on STEAM and uh, STEM jobs, uh, yeah. which is the science, technology, science, technology engineering, uh, engineering, mathematics. mathematics yeah. yeah, so making sure that we are kind of, you know, creating a pipeline from, you know, these trade schools to real jobs, um, keep making sure that we're keeping these students in the state. Um, and I think that is having a conversation with, um, you know, bigger businesses around the state and seeing what their need is and, you know, taking on these kids as, um, you know, interns and maybe uh, fellowships where they can kind of just all right, we have you, we're training you for the specific job, now you have the skill set, let's keep you here. And I think it's a great way because, you know, not everyone needs yeah. to go to college, not, maybe that, that isn't for everyone, you know. Um, maybe p people are better using their hands or, you know, actually doing um, more hard labor than, you know, reading a book and learning more about, uh, you know, philosophy or communication. So I think it's important that we are making sure these kids have real jobs and we're connecting them to them. And that's something I would love to have a conversation with and, you know, speak to, you know, chambers of commerce and yeah. have round tables. And I think that's a great thing to start doing. I've had the opportunity to have a lot of good conversations specifically about the solar field. Yeah. We haven't seen a lot of wind farming here in Connecticut yet, but, but there's a lot of companies that are beginning to employ a lot of folks, electricians, installers, mm -hmm. maintainer, maintainers, um, for, for solar energy panels, you see them kind of popping up all over rooftops. Yeah. And that's, um, it seems like that's one of the great opportunities for people to have good paying jobs. Mm -hmm. That they're, you know, people I've talked to that, that, that work in that field, they're making a decent salary. So they're able to, in a lot of cases, get out of those jobs that don't pay enough money working 40 hours to be able to afford food for your family, a roof over your head transportation to and from work. Yeah. These are, these are a, a, a burgeoning field when it comes to, um, when it comes to um, 
jobs that pay well. Yeah, and I think it's a missed opportunity for Connecticut. I mean, I think we're not really investing as much as we should be because it is a win-win all around. I mean, you're creating jobs, and then we're you know investing more in clean energy, which is better for the environment. Um, so I think it's a win-win all around, and that's definitely something I want to champion that we lead on. Uh, we have the opportunity to, and I think you know it's a blue state, and it's something yeah. we can. I mean, I know I, I worked for um, a congressman from North Carolina, and the, North Carolina, the state, you can see how much revenue would come in if they would invest in solar, but you know they want to keep it coal oriented, and you know the state is very Republican, so you know they have a hold on that. Like here in Connecticut, you know we have the opportunity to expand more. Yeah, you don't find any. Uh, you don't find any of the what do they call them slurries, in uh, <laughs> from uh, that's caused that's caused by any of the, the environmental damage that's caused being caused by uh, by solar or wind or geo, any of the other uh, alternative energies. Yeah, and and in terms of. Um, I've had folks on that have talked about how Germany, mm-hmm. Germany, which essentially has the same amount of sunlight through the course of the year as Connecticut, and yet somehow Germany has, um, they run practically all of their energy derives from thermal, from solar, or, uh, solar or wind, mm-hmm. particularly solar. Why there, why not here? I think that's that's like that's something that we're we're just missing out on. We're not we're not looking at these. We're just I mean, focusing on, you know, where the money. Sh- we're not like you know really spending where we should be, and the burden is on the taxpayer. And I think it's time we we start lightening that burden on them because it's not working. We need to take a real hard look at the books and make sure um, that these are options that are there. And let's start having the conversations. And I just think people are kind of stuck in their own same old ways, and it's time for. N- new way of thinking. Speaking of new thinking, we've had public campaign financing in Connecticut mm-hmm. for, I ran, I think, I think the year I ran, 2008, against uh, David Scribner in the 107th, was I think the first year that we had public campaign financing. Um, how is that coming? How has that evolved? And uh, where are you and your raising? How much do you have to raise? Where, should, where does it have to come from? And what are the benefits of, benefits of public campaign finance? Yeah, so the citizen election program is something that's great for, um, you know, it allows new voices and, yeah, new thinking to be allowed into the state legislature. And um, you have to raise $5,000. And of that 5000 at least 150 people who live within the towns you would represent need to donate. So having that money there um, is great because it kind of takes the, the rich, you know, yeah. folks out of the equation and it kind of levels the playing field for every person who wants to be involved and, and can and has the capacity and support to really become a player. And yeah, we're pretty much done. I'm pretty much done uh, with it. Uh, there's some, uh, we're like right at the finish line. So it's been great. And with that, once you raise that money, the state will give you $28,000 um, from a fund that they have to basically run your campaign. And I think that's why you've seen a lot of young 20-somethings um, have been getting elected and are running this year. I think this year's the most uh, 20-somethings running. So uh, we're kind of, it's time for our generation to get more involved, and I think it's a great thing. Um, And I think anyone who says that my age is a liability are the same people who championed Steve Harding in the 107th Mm -hmm. to run against a uh, businessman with 30 years of experience, so. As a legislator, who would you then be beholden to after, after being elected based on public campaign finance? Who are you beholden to after you're, you get your public campaign financing with um, an average of, um, if I do my math correctly, 150 into 5,000 is about 30, 32, 33 dollars a piece if I'm, if I'm mm-hmm. calculating properly. Who are you beholden to then? I'm yielding to the constituents, I think. Um, they're the, the only voice I care about and that I'm there to fight for. You can't buy much. You can't buy much influence for 30 or 30. <laughs> yeah. And the maximum is, I believe, $100. $100, right? yeah. You can't buy much influence with a, with a legislator for, for $100, yeah. certainly. <laughs> and mind you, again, like, most of these donations are coming from people who live within the towns and within the district. So, yeah. you know, these are the people that you are representing. So um, it's just kind of their way of supporting you and showing you that they, they do want you there for a reason. I mean, your family can donate. But, um, but I think you know the the good part about it is that they want you to be more involved in raising within the state and from those people. So I'm beholden to the constituents, and that's who I plan on speaking for. And um, that hasn't been done so far, so it's it's time. And it seems to be making a difference. Like you say, you get a lot of young folks that are that have gravitated into the system. 
mm-hmm. to, to run and, and to, to spend the time walking around. And, and if you're not going to fundraisers, you're out talking to people. Yes, not you're able, doors. You're able to carry on conversations that don't involve, do you have $1,000 that I could have to get it to get elected now? I'm Wink, wink. Yeah. I don't owe you anything afterwards for mm-hmm. that 1000 or 2000 or whatever dollars. But um, your conversations, as I recall from, from when I ran, your conversations are, in, are involve the issues. They yes. revolve around the issues and, and things that are of concern to the voters. Yeah, it's more focused. You get to free up your time to focus on what really matters. And, you know, I do every day knocking on doors um, and meeting those people and speaking to them about what really matters. That's the great part. I don't have to worry till, yeah. you know, election day, how much, much more money we need and how much, you know. So it kind of it puts a, a lock on the capacity of how much everyone needs to raise. So it's an equal playing field. You know, you can finish it early or finish it late, depending on your support um, and the commitment of people. <laughs> but... Uh, it's been a great thing, and I, it's blessed to be in Connecticut. And what do you do with, you know, you get this, this small amount of money that, that you raise and the small amount of money that the, the state provides for you to assist you with that. What type of things do you do? What type of things, what type of advertising, what type of things does that money go towards when you're reaching out to people further? It's more... Um mailer focused mm-hmm. uh, so sending like mailers out to people on the issues and kind of just your I think all of it is to, to be more of like a reinforcement of you knocking on those doors and speaking to those people so you're reminding them hey I'm Reheb this is what I stand for just you know you want to kind of make sure that you're meeting with these people a couple of times and you're having interactions with them whether that is mail by person or by phone um, and making sure that they get the message clear so I think it's a great way to reinforce that. And, I mean, we don't do TV ads, I think, maybe radio, but yeah. um, the contact is uh, grass- very grassroots, and I think it's very refreshing coming from working on the national level. I think it's, it's so old school, and it's, and it's great, and it's the reason I you know, wanted to get involved, and you really are speaking to the people. What kind of conversations have you had with people? What, what has any, have any conversations you've had with people when you go door-to-door Anything piqued your interest? Anything that you didn't expect to be talking about or didn't expect to hear from people that, that you know, and you can be, you can talk about humorous things if you want to yeah. because sometimes you run into humorous situations <laughs> yeah. when, you, when you go door to door. Well, yeah, it's a, it's a lot of dogs barking at you. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. but uh, no, I think the interesting ones is yeah. um, when I meet the Trump uh, supporters. Mm-hmm. So, you know, they kind of go off and, you know, they're like, what party are you? And I'm like, I'm a, you know, I'm a Democrat. Um, yeah. They're like, oh, well, you know, I'm voting for Trump. And blah. And I'm like, that's, you know, I'm not here to change your, your opinions on Trump. And I think if you're voting for him, I really can't change your opinion on him. Um, but, you know, to make sure that their, their kind of message that they're putting out there is that they want new people. They're sick of the same old um, system and the same corrupt uh, people that are involved in politics. And, and I'm like, oh, well, that sounds just like something... Like me, like you know, absolutely. You be, you're you're, you're an agent of change. You, yes. you are an agent of change, and that should be something that they mm-hmm. should be open to. Yes. Certainly, and that's as close as the comparison as I'll come to yeah. Trump. <laughs> yeah. But it, but it's but it's enough of a comparison yeah. because, as you say, a lot of people are just you know fed up with with what they've seen, and and would, in, in Trump's case, they'll they'll vote for anybody mm-hmm. that um, that that's not that's not that's fresher and new to new to politics. Yeah. Because they just hate politics so much, mm-hmm. but um, if you can mix that in with a little bit of logic and a little bit of yeah. clear and concise thought, that's where you end up. Yeah, exactly. And I think I, you know, not just because I'm a Democrat means I'm sticking to the, the status quo and I'm going to be, you know, part of the, you know, the blue the blue team up there at, in Hartford. I think um, I worked in Congress as a legislative uh, assistant, um, and we were a freshman member, so. You know, working on that team, you had to make sure that, you know, your, your boss isn't just talking on the floor about what's wrong. It's, you know, we're writing legislation and we're making sure that we can secure Republican votes and working with the other side. Um, and it's kind of finding those unique ways about, you know, what is each person like? And I think definitely going to Hartford, I would, you know, closely work with Steve Harding and Tony Boucher. And, you know, it's making sure that we're all working together as a team for the local area. The, no- the notion of coalition building and finding yeah. common ground with folks. Um, I'm, I'm thinking specifically of uh, Jonathan Steinberg mm-hmm. and, uh, and Bob Godfrey. Jonathan, I think, is down in uh, Norwalk and uh, Westport and Wilton a little bit, his district, and uh, Bob Godfrey, Danbury, and some other, some other areas that, um, that you can t- 
count on them not, as you say, po- towing the party line. Mm-hmm. They think for themselves, they're responsive to their constituents, they're responsive to folks, to everyone, regardless of whether they agree with them on everything or agree with them on much of anything. At yeah. least there's a, there's a voice, a conversation to be had. And I think that's that may be part of what you're what you're finding as you go door to door. You're finding some conversations that that are that are interesting. Yeah, because people are. I mean, yeah, people are sick sick of it. They're sick of the same old, and they're sick that you know that we do have the gridlock. That we, and I worked there in Congress. I saw what works and what doesn't work, and I you know I see that the real change happens at the local level. And it's time to. I mean, we can have our differences, but we should be able to find you know common ground to work on something to better our constituents in the area. So, and certainly, Connecticut does need a lot of a lot of clear and concise and, and reasonable thinking to mm-hmm. get us through. We've been here before. We were in this place decades ago, and and somehow we survived and got through it and and grew and prospered again. And you know, with uh, people working hard and and communicating well and listening to fresh ideas, Mm -hmm. you could certainly accomplish an awful lot. Yeah, and I think also, you know, with the budget, Republicans like to say, you know, how, you know, Democrats screwed it up and, you know, how reckless they are. Um, But, you know, we also know that Republicans had a say in the budget process. And if they saw the numbers weren't right, why would they just let it pass through? I think Mm -hmm. that's you're seeing, you know, they're willing to toe the party line and to make sure that they're messaging against Democrats just so, you know, and that's not a good thing that's happening to the state. Look what's happening because, you know, if there, if you saw an issue, why not speak up and try to work towards, you know, some common ground? Certainly. When either party, and it could be either party not singling out the Republicans, but when either party gets their back up and just doesn't want to communicate and just wants to, uh, to rail against the other side, the other team. Mm-hmm. What do you accomplish there besides nothing? Yep. And we see what's happening. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you very much for, uh, for joining me, and uh, hope, uh, I hope you have continued fun in uh, going door-to-door and meeting people, and uh, good luck in the election. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. This has been Progressive Soup. I'm David Stevenson. Uh, I have with me Raheb Ali Brennan, who's a candidate for the second State Assembly District, which includes part of Bethel, part of Reading, part of Danbury, and part of Newtown. And uh, you can find us on uh, YouTube, Kristen40, K R I S T I N 40, or on Facebook, Progressive Soup. That's the easier way to find us. <laughs> Thank you for joining us, and uh, enjoy the rest of your week, and we'll see you next Wednesday.